Hello and welcome to our broadcast. We apologize for the delay. We are so excited to be with you today and also just to be able to share what God's word is concerning your life and what he's saying in his word. We wanted to introduce a new format to you today. We're going to be changing it just a little bit, but we're going to be doing 30 minute segments instead of an hour segment and just kind of give you some highlights, some points as far as the scripture reading that you can do on your own, but also point out some points that we, the Lord gives us as we study. So we want to make sure you're aware that we're going to do 30 minutes instead of an hour just to hit some highlights and then we'll give you the scripture reference so when you're in your private time you can go back and read those scriptures on your own so that simply means then that you are going to have to uh, to really follow along with us a little better make certain that you actually uh, request our study guides that way you can stay up on everything and be certain to to actually uh, uh, keep up with this new format uh, so if you haven't ordered your study guide, remember this book of Genesis, there's actually three study guides. Uh, the first one uh, dealt with the, uh, the, uh, the birth or the origin of man and, of course, all the way down to the flood. Now, this next part is going to deal with Abraham, uh, specifically the father of our faith. And then the third part is going to deal with the descendants of Abraham, especially uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So it's going to be very vital, very important. We really believe that this is going to give you an opportunity. Those of you that have busy schedules to be able to catch the bulk of or the very centralized part of our teaching and at the same time be able to increase your own personal Bible study. So we're in the 12th chapter of Genesis. Uh, in our last session together, we dealt with, uh, with Abraham actually being positioned in the promised land uh, uh, following the request of God. Now, there's one thing that I, I do want to mention. Uh, again, according to the uh, testimony of Stephen mm -hmm. in the New Testament, uh, I think it's Acts chapter 7, we find that uh, God actually called Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia mm -hmm. before he got to Haran. So that simply means that, that Abraham should have been going directly to the promised land from Mesopotamia without any stops. That's Yet right. the, the Bible tells us he stopped in Haran. Uh, firstly, it said his father led the way out of Mesopotamia to Haran, and they stopped in Haran, and, and, and Abraham stayed there until his father died. And uh, then once his father died, uh, then he uh, began to go into the direct uh, command of God. Mm -hmm. So we began to see how that's one of the first areas uh, in our father of faith in not completely disobeying God. And if you don't obey God completely, uh, uh, darlings, you're going to find out that it's the same as disobedience and it delays the promises of God. Sometimes the blessings that God has promised you are not a not coming forth or happening the way God uh, would like them to, not because God is not able, not because God is saying, well, you know, I'm, I got a certain time, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. First place to look when you got a delay of promises in God is look at whether you are obeying God completely yourself uh, in the same way you were when you received the command. Amen. And we have to remember, too, like our title was the last time we did a broadcast, it was entitled, Delayed Obedience is Disobedience. So anytime we delay in what God tells us and the command God gives us, that's still disobedience. Although we may correct it eventually, we got to say, did I do it when God told me? Did, did I delay it? And the delay could be five minutes. It could be five years. But still, we have to remember, as a result of our delay, what will the promise be or what will the result be? So anytime we delay in direction God gives us, there's going to be constant consequences for that and it not just affects us but all those around us and generations to come and that's what we see with Abraham as well. So now in this 12th chapter, the 8th verse, it says, And he removed, mm -hmm. talking about Abraham, he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, mm -hmm. uh, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now mm -hmm. this is his place called there. Right. He's in the center of God's will. He's right where God wants him to be, mm -hmm. where God commanded him to go. Look at that next verse now. Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. Now, 
all the land that he could see, God said, belongs to him. Mm -hmm. So he had the freedom to move around in the midst of God's promises, mm -hmm. uh, of God's promised land, which gives us an understanding. We have the opportunity to not be still in the promises of God, mm -hmm. but to be able to shift and to move around as long as we stay in the centralized uh, command and promises of God. Mm -hmm. But look at this next verse. The 10th verse says, and there was a famine in the land, mm -hmm. And look at what it said in the midst of this. And Abram uh, went down into Egypt to sojourn there, right. for the famine was grievous in the land. Mm -hmm. Now, think about this. Why did Abraham go to Egypt? Did God tell Abraham you need to go to Egypt uh, so that uh, you won't perish? No, God didn't tell him that. Abraham had the freedom of will to make a decision. Am I going to stay in the middle of God's promises or am I going to shift myself uh, because of situations, because of circumstances? Will I shift myself to what I think or I believe is the place of my resource? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get in trouble with God, not because uh, we, uh, we have been blatantly disobeying uh, him uh, at that very moment, but sometimes we get in trouble with God because we think we know what we need to be doing better than God does. Mm -hmm. Or we misinterpret the fact that free will with God does not mean you make decisions outside of God's uh, uh, request or outside of your consultations mm -hmm. with God. Too many times, darlings, we make decisions in our free will without consulting God before we do it, right. and then we go ahead and do it, and things go haywire, and it takes us a while to realize, you know what, I really didn't obey God exactly the way he told me to, and, and I'm in a place right now where I have left the center of God's will mm -hmm. just because of my own reasoning or my own abilities of, of being able to use common sense. That's right. And I look about, you know, think about how when Abraham finally left where God told him to leave and he gets here and there's a famine in the land. And it's like, okay, God, you want me to be here, but now there's a famine. And he chooses to leave again to go somewhere where, you know, there's plenty of food and water and all those things. So even now when we look at our lives, God may command you to do something. And when you get there, when you get to this place, you, it seems to be lack. It seems to be nothing's there. And But you, you rest with the fact, well, God, you told me now, you told me now, why am I experiencing lack? Why am I experiencing so many other things going along with this? Shouldn't it be smooth? Shouldn't everything just be going fine because you told me to do this? So that's why it's important that we walk by faith. We're talking about the father of faith, and he is showing us here, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of walking by faith. Because sometimes when we look with the natural eye, it would appear that God is confused. God, maybe you meant this, or maybe you meant that. But God knows exactly what he's doing, and we can rest assured that if we follow God, if we follow the voice of God and go his way, we're going to have good success. But we got to remember, regardless of what we see. We got to remember, what did God say? Keep in mind, did he tell me to do this? Did God tell me to do this? And if he did not, then we need to make sure we stay on course because we learn when we don't, then there's also consequences to making our own decisions based on what we see, based on what we perceive, based on what we understand. And we know, according to Proverbs, that we cannot lean on our own understanding, but we have to trust in God with all our heart. So, so as you begin to look at your faith, now, this is the father of our faith, and we can learn a lot by examining the life of, of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So we begin to see now that Abraham's faith was not an instantaneous uh, occurrence that only needed to happen once. Mm -hmm. But his, uh, his faith was a journey. And you need to understand that when you come to God, when you begin to live for the Lord, when you begin to trust in him, that your faith is not going to be at a level of understanding that's necessary for you to do everything that God commanded you to do. But there's a process. There's a growing. There is a journey. And you go from faith to faith. I like what, uh, what was recorded in one of the Gospels. It said, uh, you know, when you look at faith, first you have the, the stalk of corn and I'm paraphrasing this, then you have the, the ears of corn, then you have the corn on the, on the, uh, 
on the ears. So it's a process. That's the way faith is. Faith is a process. But in that process, you have free will. In that process, you can elect to obey God or you can elect to do or to go along with what you've been doing or how you've been operating. Thank God that we have the word of God because it helps us to understand and to be able to really get deeper into a, a, an obedience to God. That's why the Bible tells us, I believe it's uh, Romans 10 and 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So your gauge is the word of God. Are you doing what God commanded you do, to do according to your practical understanding of the word of God? Are you disobeying God by, by what you're doing just because it's convenient or because you, you, you feel like that God has forsaken you? Here, Abraham was actually in a position where there was a famine in the land. Now, the reason we can know that this was not God's perfect will for Abraham is not only the fact of what he encountered mm -hmm. in going into Egypt, but guess what? A famine hit his son Isaac the same way, mm -hmm. and God told Isaac, do not go into Egypt. That's he right. told him, you stay right here in the land, and you sow in this land. And the Bible tells us that Isaac sowed in the midst of a famine. Mm -hmm. He sowed in the place that God had commanded him to be in and got a hundredfold increase. Listen, whatever is going on in your life, whatever lack you're experiencing right now, are you in the center of God's will? Because if you're in the center of God's will, God will provide. God will take care of you. God will look after you. God is your resource. Remember this, God, not man, God is your resource. Now, God's going to use man to bring resources to you, but but you don't have to go out and beg and plead and search for it. You just make your needs known unto God and God will make certain that the necessary steps are taken to fulfill that need. Amen. And I have seen that I witnessed it, especially the last five years where God guides, God provides. You know, I think about all the things that the directions God has given us as far as being here in Franklin, Virginia. And there were moments that I said to Apostle, I'm like, well, you know, we're here, but you know, it seemed like things are not working out or the finances are not coming coming in as fast as they should, especially early on. And he would say, no, this is where we need to be and God will provide. And every single time, it could be a day before, it could be an hour before, <laughs> and God would show up. And when it first started happening, I was blown away because he was always really, really calm. He said, no, God's got it. If God told us to be here, and he did, then God is our source, and he uses men. So it would be somewhere somebody would call, somebody would text, or we would just get it out of the blue. And it wasn't out of the blue to God because he already knew. But I'm saying this there's to remind you, if you're in the place called there, God is going to provide. And it may not show up a week ahead of time. But for me, I'm a planner. So I like to know that, you know, next week when this is due, next week when I need this, it's going to be there. But that's not how God works all the time. Sometimes he just wants us to trust when he says that he's going to do it, it's going to come. And when we believe him, when we trust him, he's going to show up every single time. And it's going to be more, just like Ephesians 3 and 20 says. It talks about now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. It's according to my faith. It's according to the power that is working in me. But he is waiting on my faith. He's not. God has all the resources in the world. But when I finally settle down and say, okay, God. This is your this is your stuff. This is not my stuff. This is not my building. This is not my ministry. It's your ministry. And when I finally settle down and know that he's going to take care of his ministry, that's when the blessings show up and the resources show up. You, you know, as I think about uh, when God commanded us to come to, to Franklin, we were not running from anybody. Mm -hmm. We were not running from anything. We were running to something. Amen. And sometimes people will mistake your shifting or your moving as you're running away from something or you've done something terrible or something bad. Mm -hmm. Why not look on the positive side? Uh, you've got to run to where God wants you to be. You do not need to be dragging around if you're in the wrong place. You need to be where God wants you to be. And I remember when we got here in Franklin, mm -hmm. uh, we, had, we found a place that we were going to be able to not just uh, just uh, uh, rent, but we were going to be able to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the man had a deadline. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, he said, well, you know, I'll give you 45 days. Mm -hmm. Uh, but go ahead and move in. We took, we we got all of our furniture, everything, and moved it into that house. Mm -hmm. And we had started living in that house. Had been living in it for forty five days. And the uh, the the uh, realtor we were working with, a mortgage company, mm -hmm. said it's going to be another uh, uh, three weeks before we can really close on this. Mm -hmm. Well, we told the the uh, the owner it's going to be another three weeks. He said, I can't wait three weeks. Mm -hmm. He said, there's no way. He said, I got to have my money now. Uh, you know, you, 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 you all need to either come up with the money to buy this place or I need you to vacate the premises. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so uh, we went back and talked to the mortgage company and to the realtor, and they said, well, there's no way we can do anything uh, uh, within the next three weeks. Yeah. And so I told him that again. He made the same statement. So we, we, uh, we, we got all our furniture together, and, mm -hmm. and LT was like, well, you know, uh, well, what are we going to do? I said, I told her, I said, this furniture is not going back to Smithfield. I said, everything we've got here is in Franklin. This is where God wants us to be. And this furniture is not leaving this city. That's so right. I said, we're going to go rent us a storage bay. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put our furniture in the storage bay. Mm -hmm. And we're going to actually uh, try to find a way to last until the, 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 the door is finally open. We know in three weeks it's going to happen. So we just need to, need to be able to hang on for three weeks. Mm -hmm. you know? So you, you see, we'd already made up our mind that we were going to get in the center of God's will for our lives, regardless of the cost. It's important, darlings, that you find the will, find the purpose that God has for you and be willing to make whatever sacrifices you've got to make to be in God's perfect will for your life. Thank God Almighty that we all don't have the same perfect will. God has an individual perfect will for all of us. But if we get in it, we're going to find that there will be others that will actually be reconciled to that perfect will that God commanded us to be in. Mm -hmm. But we stayed right here. Then three weeks, everything came through. Mm -hmm. We had to find another house, but we found another house. house. And it was a better house, mm -hmm. a better deal. Mm -hmm. And we were able to move in in three weeks. But we did not leave Franklin. Right. We did not do like Abraham did here mm -hmm. and go down to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. Now, you talk about a famine when you don't have no place to live. We knew absolutely no one in Franklin. Mm -hmm. We knew no one. We had no kinfolk here. We had no friends here. We had nothing but the will and the purpose of God here. That's all we had. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, darlings, you got to recognize that where God sends you or where God wants you to be may be away from family. It may be away from friends. It may be away from your comfort zone. Right. But ask yourself the question, is this where God wants me to be. Amen. And if it is, uh, as the old saying goes, come hell or high water, you need to be where God wants you to be. Amen. Recognize the will of God. Recognize the purpose of God. And recognize that you have a place called there in God. That's where God commands the blessings. Amen. God commands the blessings in your place called there. You are not going to be blessed wherever you go as the central point of your resources. Right. But it's going to be a specific place that God will want you to operate in that will bring forth the abundance of God's blessings. But in the midst of that, you're going to have famines. Mm -hmm. In the midst of that, you're going to have hardship. In the midst of that, you're going to have times when you are going to begin to waver or doubt even yourself. All I can tell you, darlings, is you don't need to tie a knot in the rope and hang on. You need to start climbing that rope. In other words, instead of, if you're at the end of your rope, that means you're too close to where you came in. Mm -hmm. Climb on up a little bit on that rope. Get closer to God and watch God move. Amen. And, and it's something I wanted to say just to encourage those of you, not just the leaders, but those of you that God has ever given direction. I must say, don't give up just because of what it's going to cost you. Don't put it aside just because of what it's going to cost you. And I think about in the natural, if it's a woman, you know, most of the time we like purses, we like clothes. And if we see something that we want, it does not matter how much it costs. And we got to save up for weeks or for months. We are going to get that. If it's our male partners, you know, sometimes they like cars. They like trucks. And if they see something they want, 
if they want it bad enough, they will sacrifice whatever they need to sacrifice to pay for that truck. So we need to be the same way and when it comes to spiritual things. Don't just give up a desire or something God has told you to do just because you see the cost. No, realize that if God has told you to do this, he's going to provide the resource. He's going to provide the grace. And sometimes it's not always resources. Sometimes you just need grace to hang on. You need wisdom. You need understanding. God, how do I navigate this? Because I know you're here. I know I have your favor. So sometimes it's just a matter of saying, God, help me to give me the grace. And the grace is already there. It's just a matter of receiving the grace for the assignments, receiving the grace for what God has told you to do. So remember, never give up a desire. Never give up on what God has told you to do just because of what it's going to cost you. Because just like Abraham, God had, provided, had given him a son after all those years. We think about the story of Isaac. And then he told him to sacrifice it. So we got to remember, and we're going to talk about this later, but we got to remember how God provided a ram in the bush. But Abraham was willing to give up the very thing that he desired just to still be in the center of God's will. And we have to be the same way regardless of the cost. You, you look at, if you will, at the 11th verse and said, It came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman mm -hmm. uh, to look upon. He said, You are beautiful. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians mm -hmm. shall see thee mm -hmm. that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Now, where did such a thought of him dying come from when God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations? When God said, I'm going to bless you, uh, and, and those that bless you are going to be blessed. Those that curse you are going to be cursed. Where did all this mindset of, being, of him being wiped off the planet, him being killed before any of God's promises come to pass? Where did that come from? Right. Listen to me. When it comes to God making a promise to you, Yes. Do not think for one moment that it's for your generation coming after you if he made the promise to you and that you're going to have to wait until uh, you get the glory and look back down and see your children or your children's children walking in what God promised you. No, if God made a promise to you, darlings, you are not going to leave the face of this planet until you at least enter into those promises. Now, how far it goes is up to God, but your entering into the promises of God starts with God. And listen, if God told you you're going to see a thing, why would you think that you, anybody can stop it or anybody can change it. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. You don't have to do anything to work against those who are working against you. You keep doing what you're supposed to be doing for God and those weapons will actually turn back on them. I don't, see warfare, spiritual warfare, I think we've got it a little twisted. Mm -hmm. We think spiritual warfare means that we need to be out wrestling with what the devil is doing and wrestling with all these things that are going on. No, darlings, your spiritual warfare starts with your being properly armored. Yes. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet showered with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having the shield of faith and, and the, the sword of the spirit and so on and so forth. That is your equipment for your spiritual warfare and you've got to recognize you don't have to wrestle with the devil. Amen. You don't have to wrestle with him, darlings. He is already defeated. But you need to know this. And until you grow in your proper place in God, you're going to have your doubts. You're going to have your questions. You're going to have different things going on with you. But recognize that if God promised you something, he's going to do it. And there is not a devil in hell that can change that. Only you can change what God has promised to you. And the way you change it is by making some of the mistakes that the father of our faith made. First mistake he made was he delayed going completely into the place that God had told him to go into. Right. The second mistake he made was when hard times hit, he picked up his bags and everything and shifted to a place where he could get his, his uh, needs met for him and his family, yet it meant leaving the, the centralized place of the promises of God. And now we find that he is in Egypt and now he's lying. I, I, yeah, Sarah was uh, was his half sister. If you use half as a stance, meaning that they had different mothers, but they all had the same father. Both he and Sarah had the fa same father. They just had different mothers. So she was his his uh, half sister in that sense. But here he's saying, "You tell them that uh, uh, you tell them that you are my sister." Mm -hmm. 
not my half sister. You tell them you are my sister, which in that day meant she was open game uh, because she really doesn't belong to anyone. And then he said, you know, why, why would you do this? So that they won't kill me. And Sarah it was a very, very submitted wife. Guess what she did? She actually did what her husband asked her to do. Amen. And, you know, we're not going to read all of the, the scriptures. Like I said, we want you to go back and read those for yourself. But if you look at that one, the last point, of course, in on verse 13, when he tells her, you know, this is what I want you to say. He did it out of fear. And we cannot try to help God out out of fear. When God tells us something, we have to trust that he is going to do it, regardless of what it looked like. And, look, of course, we can learn from the mistake of Abraham when he told Sarah to, you know, just say this so to save my life. God is going to protect you. And like Apostle said, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Everything is going to work out for your good. And remember, God does not need our help. He is God. So he doesn't need us to try to help him out. He doesn't need us to lie. He doesn't need us to scheme or be deceptive on our behalf. But he needs us to trust him and know that he's going to work it out for our good. But the bottom line is, do we trust him? Do we have faith that what he says is going to come to pass? And the first thing we have to do is be obedient, not delayed obedience, but we have to be obedient at the first command. Now, that 16 verse, we're going to shift down a little bit. It says, and, and he entreated, the Pharaoh entreated Abram to he take, he took Sarah into his harem mm -hmm. and he entreated uh, Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men service and maid service and she asses and camels. And the Lord, uh, so he blessed Abram. He blessed him. But look at what happened. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues mm -hmm. because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister, so I might have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. And the Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and he uh, and, and his wife and all that he had. So you, you, you see, God still had his protection. But, but listen to me. God did not uh, plague Pharaoh because of Abraham's lie. Yeah. No, God does not line himself up with unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. God lines himself up with righteousness. Hear me, darling. This is very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something contrary to the will and purpose of God, and you still see, see God still having certain good things happen around you, he is not doing it because of your actions. He's not doing it because of your uh, his love for you when you're not obeying him. Amen. He is doing it because someone that you're connected to is really obeying God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be, you can be protected in your disobedience by having the right kind of covering. That's right. Because God is going to bless those that will obey him. Mm -hmm. Sarai was in obedience to God. Her husband commanded her to do what she did, but she was in obedience to God. So God plagued Pharaoh and his household, not for Abraham's sake, but for Sarai's sake. In he, other words, God lined himself up with the, that one that was doing right. Amen. And I love, I love the story of the protection, how God protected the lineage. Yes, Abraham lied, but God has seen generations beyond that. You know, how is this going to affect the promise if she, you know, she's contaminated? So I love the fact that even in his promises, even in our failures and our mistakes, that God still steps in. He, his provision, his divine provision still makes a way that even curves our, our mistakes, the things that we do outside of his will. And that's the thing we have to look at. And remember, God has a promise. It's not just attached to us, but those that are attached to us as well for generations to come. And sometimes we can make bad mistakes. We can make bad decisions. But God is still looking out for those that are coming after us. How is this going to affect them? And then he steps in and makes divine provision. And I love the story of protection of, of Sarah and Abraham. And Abraham could have been killed. I think about how the Pharaoh just sent them away. He could have been angry enough to kill them, kill him, but he just sent them away. He recognized this, is, this man is different. This woman is different. And we understand that he saw something in them to just send them away and not harm them. And, and another thing you look at, think about this, if you will. Uh, God did this because Sarah was obedient in what she did. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, this is something that's very vital when it comes to submission, mm -hmm. when it comes to subjection. 
if you will, just remember, you may have, your leader may not, uh, may do something contrary to the will mm -hmm. or the purpose of God. Right. That does not mean that you are going to be cursed because they are cursed. Mm -hmm. That means that, in, in essence, from, a, from an, an example like this, it shows us that long, as long as you do your part, mm -hmm. as long as you're faithful in what you're doing, as long as you're operating the way you should operate, you will not have your blessings canceled. Amen. God's going to bless you. And if God has made a promise that you are attached to, you are going to receive the full benefits of that promise. Amen. So so what? Your leader does some things that are not right. Amen. Do not follow suit with them and do like they're doing, Amen. but you do the will and the purpose of God in the midst of it. Be faithful to God and God will come through for you. Amen. And it looks like our time is up for today, but we have enjoyed it. And like I said, we're changing our format just a little bit because we're going to be going with a different network soon. But we pray that something was said, something you gather from the word of God concerning your life, that you can grab a hold of it. Read the book of Genesis chapter 12 that we had just talked about and make sure you understand what is God saying to me concerning this. And make sure that when God gives you a command that you're not delaying. Make sure that when he says something, you're not trying to alter his plan, but you're walking in direct obedience to what he has said and then you're going to receive the blessing after that but we cannot expect to receive a blessing or provision or direction when we have not followed god at his first command so so just just relax darlings come to the realization that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world and with god all things are possible to them that believe. God Amen. bless you. Love you. Looking forward to being with you in our next broadcast. Continue in God's greatest. Amen. God bless.